For years, the middleweight division of boxing has been known as the one that has been jinxed. Tragedy has stalked the champions and top men of that class for many years. But in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the heavyweight division was hit with tragic deaths. But these tragedies among the heavyweights were nothing new. It just never was publicized as much as the jinx among the middleweights. In fact, the first three fighters of note to die tragically were heavyweights. Former American champion Yankee Sullivan was killed in San Francisco in 1856, and another former American champion, Jim Elliott, was slain seven years later in a brawl in a Chicago saloon. Joe Goddard, a top heavyweight of the Sullivan era, died of a gunshot wound during an election riot in Camden, New Jersey in 1903. The death of Stanley Ketchell in 1910 started the jinx on the middleweights. Yet in 1913, Jim Barry, a top heavyweight, died of a bullet wound during a brawl in a Cologne Panama Cafe. And in 1917, Al Palzer, one of the original White Hopes, was slain by his father after a family argument. Bill Brennan, who had failed in 1920 to capture the title from Jack Dempsey, being knocked out in 12 rounds, was shot and killed four years later during a holdup in New York City. In 1927, Bartley Madden, a later White Hope, died of injuries suffered in a fall in Washington, D.C. W.F. Young Stribling, who was one of the most active of all fighters, died following a motorcycle crash in Atlanta, Georgia. And in 1933, Strib had lasted into the 15th and final round in a title fight with Max Schmeling in Cleveland in 1931. Napoleon Jack Dorval, a popular heavyweight, was killed in an airplane crash near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1936. South African champion Ben Ford died of battle wounds suffered in World War II in 1942. And in 1946, the great former champion Jack Johnson succumbed of injuries suffered in a car crash outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. For the next 23 years, things went smoothly and only the middleweight jinx was mentioned. Then, suddenly, it struck the heavyweights again. Rocky Marciano, the only truly undefeated heavyweight champion, was killed when a small airplane in which he was a passenger crashed during a thunderstorm over the plains of western Iowa. Rocky died, sadly, on his 46th birthday, September 1st, 1969. The death of Sonny Liston still is shrouded in mystery. His body was discovered on January 7, 1971, but it was believed that he was dead for at least a week before his body was found in his home. The complete cause of death has never been revealed, with only the listing of natural causes given out by the state of Nevada. Then the heavyweight jinx claimed Lou Savold, Zora Foley, and Eddie Machen. Savold, the blonde bomber from Iowa, who became a contender after shifting his home base to Patterson, New Jersey, died of an apparent heart attack. Then within a month, the other two men, so similar in abilities and style, passed on. First, Foley died in Phoenix, Arizona at the age of 40 when he was drowned after striking his head when diving into a swimming pool. Then Mitchin was killed after falling from a second-story apartment window, very possibly sleepwalking. Mitchin was also 40. The similarities between the two soft-spoken gentlemanly Mitchin and Foley were sharply drawn. Their fistic careers paralleled each other. Foley turned pro in 1953, and while he had not fought in over a year, still considered himself active at the time of his death. Machen made his pro debut in 1955 and retired in 1967. Both had begun their careers in impressive fashion. Foley won 39, lost 2, and boxed a draw, scoring 25 knockouts from 1953 to 1958, establishing himself as a top contender for Floyd Patterson. From 1955 to 1958, Machen went undefeated in 24 fights, scoring 16 knockouts, and he too was a top contender. Their paths crossed in San Francisco on April 9, 1958. It was a drab boxing match with the less experienced Machen 
holding Foley to a draw. Machen, who along the way had knocked out Tommy Hurricane Jackson, Nino Valdez, Julio Maderas, John Holman, and beaten Johnny Summerlin, Joey Maxim, and Bob Baker, gained stature from the draw, but still both he and Foley were shunned by Patterson. On September 14th, Machen journeyed to Sweden to face the unknown Ingemar Johansson.
In the first round, Johansson landed his powerful right and knocked Machen out. And Ingemar went on to fight Patterson and win the heavyweight title. For the next two years, the Patterson-Johansson series occupied the heavyweights. Machen came back. He won seven in a row and faced Foley again in San Francisco. Zora, following their draw, had 11 fights, winning 10, losing only to Henry Cooper in London. He, too, was still on the outside looking in. The duo was by this time joined by Sonny Liston as the top contenders for the heavyweight title. The second Machen Foley fight was just about a carbon copy of the first. This time, Zora got a close, split decision victory. Before 1960 was out, Liston was to eliminate both, first by knocking out Foley and then by outpointing Machen in what was a dull, boring fight. This type of match was becoming the trademark of Machen, who, after the Johansson fight, seemed to have lost the fire he had possessed. Both Machen and Foley remained near the top of the challengers in 1961, but still were left out of the title picture. By 1961, Machen had won five of six, while Foley took four of five, including a KO over Cooper. Machen kept plugging along in 1962 after Liston became champion. But despite the fact that he was the only one to go to limit with Sonny after Liston became a top liner, he was not given an opportunity to fight for the crown. By 1964, Machen did get his chance at Patterson, but by then, Patterson was an ex-champ on the comeback, and Machen lost the decision after 12 boring rounds. Evidently, losing was the key to success because when the WBA, in one of their many unanswerable decisions, declared the heavyweight title, then held by Muhammad Ali, vacant, they gave their stamp of approval to a match between Eddie Machen, inactive for 10 months, and Ernie Terrell for the title. The match was the dreariest of bouts. It was difficult for the spectators to stay awake, and when it was over, Terrell was the winner after what seemed like 100 rounds. Machen drifted along after that, losing to Manuel Ramos and Carl Mindenberger and drawing with Elmer Rush. Then he seemed to find new life as he whipped the previously undefeated Joey Orbio and Jerry Quarry back to back and followed that up with a victory over Scrap Iron Johnson. These victories earned him a shot at Joe Frazier, then in 1966 a hot up and comer. That's Joe Frazier in green trunks, moving out with his customary aggressive style. Frazier has been nicknamed Smoking Joe as a result of his relentless punching. Joe has won all 12 of his professional fights, 11 by knockout. Eddie Machen in the white trunks is a veteran with over 30 knockouts to his credit. But one of Eddie's greatest moments in the ring was a very close loss by decision to the ponderous punching Sonny Liston when Sonny was at his crushing best. Many observers thought Eddie actually won that fight. There's not much feeling out between these two fighters. They're both ripping those punches in there. Frazier always attempts to corner his man, is always putting on enormous pressure, punching, bobbing, weaving. This fight is scheduled for 12 rounds, and Frazier has been made a 3-1 to one favorite. Ripping punches by Joe Frazier.
Machen attempts to stay in close, trying to neutralize Fraser's punching power. Joe sends in those ripping body shots. A crushing left by Joe Fraser. And down goes Eddie Machen at the end of round one. Eddie's on the outside ring apron. He's courageously getting to his feet. He says he's all right. And here comes Joe. Joe comes out for round two. He wants to go home early. Now Fraser's throwing bombs in there. Machen is fighting back. Ripping, crushing punches by Joe Fraser. Smoking Joe began his professional career in 1965, one year ago, right after winning the heavyweight championship of the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Joe is 22 years old, and everyone predicts that nothing human can stop this rampaging young heavyweight from becoming the world heavyweight champion. Fraser won't give Machen any room. Joe stays on top of Eddie. Eddie Machen in white trunks taking a battering here in round two. throws a flurry of punches trying to keep Fraser off of him. But Joe comes right back. Ripping, crushing punches by Joe Fraser. Once again, Machen's back is on the ropes. That's the wrong place to be when you're fighting Joe Fraser. Machen taking a terrible beating here in round two. The seventh round was all Fraser. Joe trying to get in that one big bomb to end it. In round eight, it's still Fraser putting on that constant pressure. Eddie has taken some of the best punches Smoking Joe can dish out, and he's hanging in there. The courageous Machen is always looking to get in that one big upset punch to turn the tide. Joe never lets up, never gives Eddie any room to breathe. Machen looks very tired in there. He's taken a pounding for eight rough rounds. Amazing. 
Machen, flat-footed, just hanging on. Joe seems to be able to do just anything he wants to here in round eight. Those are ripping punches by Joe Frazier. A murderous hook by Joe Frazier, and Machen came back with a hard left, almost sending Frazier to the canvas. That's the punch Eddie's been looking for. Round nine saw Machen continue to weaken under the Fraser onslaught. It's round 10, the final round, and the question is whether Eddie can last it out. The referee steps in and stops the fight, awarding a 10th round knockout win to smoking Joe Fraser. Machen made a game effort but was stopped by Frazier in the last round. He had two fights in 1967, losing to Henry Clark and being stopped by Boone Kirkman, after which he announced his retirement. He had an overall record of 50 wins, 11 losses, and 3 draws with 29 knockouts. The promise was always there, but never fulfilled. Foley drifted along from 1962 to 1967. He won some over George Chivalo, Robert Clarou, Billy Daniels, Doug Jones, Paul Andrews, Bob Foster, Oscar Bonavena, Henry Clark, but he lost to Ernie Terrell in a fight as thrilling as the Machen Terrell one. He drew with Carl Mildenberger and then was at long last given a title fight. He faced Muhammad Ali in what was to be Ali's last fight before his enforced absence from the ring. Muhammad Ali, the white trunks, Zora Foley, the challenger, in the dark trunks, they are brown. Foley is a patient fighter, counterpuncher, and he gets in a light right hand there. Ali, the champion, figures to circle the ring till he's ready to carry the attack to his opponent. Now remember, especially in the early rounds, the 34-year-old Foley will be dangerous. Time could work again. The champion has speed, great speed. Two minutes left in round one. And that's a little less majesty. The challenge is showing no respect for the champion. Out of respect, probably, for Foley's punching power, the champion keeping his gloves up higher than he usually does. He usually dangles them at his hips. Champion seemingly is going to get aggressive any moment. He's looking for the spot. And that was not a soft punch. Foley has brought the crowd up with those punches. Ten seconds left in round one. Ali's looking to get in there now with that famous flurry. He's also got to watch the countering right hand. Bothering Foley, apparently. Two minutes left in this round. 
Johnny Lobianco, a very fine referee, is in there. Foley is getting those jabs into the body, too. Some of the crowd is yelling, stand still, Foley. Don't walk around and get tired. I guess Zora knows what to do. They have both had harder sessions in the gymnasium, but without the tension of the championship match. Notice how Foley can ride back with those punches, but now the champion's jab is getting in there. Got in his first good right hand that time. Flush on the jaw. Foley took it well. Round three of Madison Square Garden. The champion is now finding his opponent with jabs and is looking better. See how quick the champion's left hand is? Ten seconds to go in this round. Round three. <laughs> Round four in this heavyweight match. Muhammad Ali, the champion of all the world in the white trunk. Foley, the challenger from Chandler, Arizona. Champion weighing 211 and a half. Foley, 202 and a half. Although there's little action, the crowd doesn't seem to mind. Champion Ali is always a show, no matter what he's doing. Foley is gradually cutting down the, uh, the distance that Ali is away from him. He, he's trying to corner, Ali is trying to corner him little by little. See how well the challenger rolls back from those punches. And there's Foley down. Five, six, seven, eight. Foley is up at nine. About a minute and 40 seconds left to go in the round and Foley is back battling. They said Foley wouldn't be Tiger, but he is. This has turned into quite a fight, hasn't it? One minute to go in round four. Foley bleeding from the nose. Foley's coming back from that knockdown, and he is scoring. One of the infrequent clinches. The punches that put Foley down came so fast, you could hardly see them. Nothing wrong with Foley's courage, believe me. Ten seconds to go in round four. Don 
Sean Dunphy at ringside in this heavyweight championship match. Muhammad Ali, the champion, the white trunks, challenges Zora Foley and Brown. In case you join us late, Foley was down from a combination in the fourth round. Took the count listening to it and got up and has fought fairly well since. In the last round or so, the champion Speed has been turning the fight his way. Now he is moving in, which is, has been unusual for him in this fight. That was a block punch, and uh, Foley rolled with them. Ten minutes to go in round seven. Who, oh, of course, is the sentimental favorite with the crowd. talked about Foley's courage. The champion has plenty himself. There's no question about that. Foley down from that right hand. I don't know if he's going to make this one. Six. Seven. Eight. He's not. Oh, he gamely tried to get up. And Muhammad Ali has retained his heavyweight championship of the world. After about one minute and 55 seconds of the seventh round, Foley tried game. Gamely, he gave the champion the best battle of the champion's career. That is, since he has been champion. And here's Johnny Addy with the announcement. Foley gave it his best, but at 31, he was no match for Ali and was knocked out in the seventh round. He continued along, as previously noted, losing to Brian London and then being knocked out in one round by Mac Foster, his last ring appearance in September 29, 1970. Again, the similar ending, both knocked out by local idols as part of a buildup, closing out their careers. Machen, who had been convicted for armed robbery at age 20 and served a three-year prison sentence, turned to boxing in 1955. He made a lot of money, but seemed to drift along. In 1962, he was admitted to the State Hospital in Napa, California for observation and treatment of what authorities called acute schizophrenia and paranoia. At the time, it was reported that he had spoken of suicide. However, after six months, he returned to boxing. At the time, Machen said, what have I got to show for all my years as a ranking heavyweight? Nothing. His death came about when he fell from the window of his apartment in San Francisco. A close friend told police that he often walked in his sleep. In fact, one time he was picked up by police several blocks from his home. Machen, who was employed as a longshoreman at the time of his death, died, according to the autopsy report, from shock and loss of blood from a ruptured liver. The head injuries received in the fall were described as minor. So ended the lives of Foley and Machen, two men cut from the same cloth. With a smile or a wink from Lady Luck, either or both could have been heavyweight champion of the world. Yet just as with Marciano and Liston, who did achieve that honor, Jinx showed no favorites in the final hour. <laughs>